Hello everyone, it's Tuesday night. I'm Dr. Boz and I am telling you, throw away the scale or at least put it in the back corner. Why would I do that? Especially when talking about the most stubborn weight, that belly weight. Seems to be the first one to come on and the last to leave. Well, there's some secret things that you should know about your belly fat. We're going to talk about that tonight. It will have a lot of relevance to the folks watching. If you've been struggling with metabolic health, we're here to teach you a little nugget every Tuesday night. So thanks for joining me live. Those of you that are, are here live, you'll notice there are no commercials during the live show. We only turn the commercials on in the replay. So that's one reason to tune in. The second reason is uh, my fans tell me when I am actually using a microphone and when I'm not. So thank you for showing up the comments that go in this uh, in this live whenever there's a good question, especially those relevant to what we're talking about tonight. My team puts them at the end of the show and then the last 20 minutes, I do answer your questions. So thank you for tuning in tonight. I had a couple of uh, pretty harsh feedbacks from last week when I tried to swallow these while everybody was watching me online. So. I did it ahead of time this week. Uh, my microphone must pick it up really well because there was more than one of you who said, oh my gosh, the sound of you swallowing uh, the, the liquid was, it was gross. <laughs> so, oopsie. Uh, anyway, I won't do that again, at least not right into the microphone with a bunch of pills. Uh, but I am gonna show you my experiment. Uh, as per usual, Tuesdays are the day I break my fast. Every week I fast. And if you're looking for a, a uh, community that does that, there's a lot of folks following me on this channel that also fast. But I, um, I break my fast sometimes after this show. So this uh, glucose came back at 76, counting down ketones. And this week I... Uh, uh, I've done a couple of different things to just, yeah, test that out. Check that out. 2.7. I don't know if I'm going to be able to raise that. So again, my fast wasn't that great, meaning I started Sunday afternoon instead of Sunday morning. I haven't cheated, but I have been taking MCT. Uh, and it's because on the show, usually I try to take a supplement and show you what it does. But um, even when you're fasted, it doesn't really affect, it doesn't get into your bloodstream as quickly as I wanted it to last week. So I said on Tuesday morning, I started with, yeah, a fistful of these. Um, two weeks ago, I ate butter. And then this week, I had a fistful this morning. And then right before the show, probably 30 minutes before the show started, I took another, I don't know, 12 of them or so. Um, to show you what happens when you just have MCT. We're going to talk more about that later on the show. We do have a great show for you tonight and is very relevant to anybody who struggled with belly fat. We are going to get into that. Um, oh, I see uh, some people's questions are already making it onto my list. Oh, goody, goody. <clears throat> uh, so there are some announcements. I'll do those halfway through the show. Uh, we're going to get started right away with... Um, well, there's actually one announcement that's up on my, on my, um, this is my Instagram page. And on my Instagram page, I uh, want to show you that there are a few things that we've been working on for a while. And by me, we, I mean the team that really makes me look good. So if you go to my Instagram reel, you can find any of the reels now that hopefully you can't hear anything. I can't hear anything. Uh, but if you push that little um, cart at the bottom, our products are all on there. And we are super happy to show you that you get a major discount if you uh, buy the Cucumber Lemon off of Facebook or Instagram. So if you want, it's 25% discount. Go to that cart and you can use it that way. Uh, but I'm so proud of myself for getting that hooked up on my iPad to be able to show you. <laughs> Look at that. Let's get to what I am really here to talk about, which is... Um, we are going to talk about the slides that I have ready for tonight because there is, uh, there are several myths out there in, in, um, um, in the world of losing weight. And one of them is by far, uh, the most difficult to teach about. Um, and that has to do with cholesterol, but I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm talking about that at KetoCon in four days. Uh, I practiced those slides this morning with my support group and... Yeah, they gave me a pretty good rating, so I, I think it's going to go great. 
Um, all right, here we go. Let me um, push play. There we go. Okay, I had a button that wasn't working right there. All right, so we are going to talk about the myth of belly fat leaving your body to uh, as fast as people want it to leave their body. I've had patients come in and say, Dr. Bahas, if I hook up a TENS unit to my stomach, will all that belly fat disappear? Uh, Dr. Bahas, I, I have been working to decrease my belly fat for the better part of 20 years. Why is it so hard uh, to get my belly fat to disappear? And I'm here to tell you that there is absolutely a reason why your belly fat is being so stubborn. Uh, it takes a little bit of a lesson in, uh, in the world of uh, chemistry and fat to get you through that. So let's start with this pretty picture. Yes, this is a picture of your skin. And in that layer under the skin, on top of the muscle, is, is fat. That fat is specifically the subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat. And that fat is different than the fat that you're struggling with to get removed. Yes, this is the subcutaneous fat. That subcutaneous fat does an incredible uh, job of uh, insulating us and protecting us, but it isn't the nasty, nasty problem that happens in a deeper layer of fat. Uh, that deeper layer of fat is what makes our bellies, is what makes the um, uh, the belly uh, a, a an actual metabolic organ. Um, as I've tried to describe to a couple of my teammates, uh, they look at this fat right here and say, well, that's metabolic fat, right? That's visceral fat. And I said, no, 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 no. That is still outside of, I'm gonna draw this in white. See this white line right there? That is the muscle layer. And anything on the outside of that muscle layer is still considered subcutaneous fat, even though it's this big portion, oopsie, I'll do that in red, this big portion of fat here, it's the fat that's underneath that, the visceral fat. Let's go back here. The visceral fat that I am, uh, that I want to bring your attention to. It's also that visceral fat that is causing you to have that resistant weight loss. The part that says, Doc, if I could just get my belly fat to go away, uh, I'm telling you, quit looking at the scale, quit chasing that number. We have a much better uh, way to help you with that. And it comes with the understanding of how much different metabolically that fat is in the visceral areas than in the subcutaneous areas. I have a story to tell that when I was in medical school, um, you get a cadaver to dissect and to learn about. And I will never forget how powerful I learned about visceral fat because my cadaver was metabolically sick. Uh, and inside her intestines, this is what happened. The fat wove in around, uh, this is her, I mean, your intestines should be this, right? I should be able to pick it up and what they call run the ball. You should be able to just kind of, it's like a hose. You should be able to do that. But I had to spend hours dissecting out that intestine in my cadaver because her gut was just socked in with fat. Everything was held in place because that visceral fat had become a live organ inside her. And, um... And I got a few points off because I cut a few things deep in that fat when I got frustrated. And that did not, yeah, that did not pay out. Uh, the, the reason that fat grows is because of a constant stimulus. That stimulus started probably for most people with metabolically metabolic injuries or that stubborn belly fat. It probably started at puberty. Uh, yeah, when the hormones of maturation started to rise, so did your sensitivity to a few things like insulin. Uh, if you happen to pour on some of the, oh, highly processed carbohydrates when you were 12, because that was the thing to do, uh, your stimulus began. The specific stimulus I'm talking about is a stimulus of insulin. Um, as it became more and more um, uh, common for that stimulus inside your body, your that belly fat became resistant. Uh, 
Now, the next few slides are some of my favorite slides for teaching this. Um, my team warned me they're a little bit complicated, so just stick with me on this. Uh, but I'm going to show you the progression of a 10-year-old. Uh, I, use, I use this little boy named Willie. He's real. He was uh, on our mission trip last year, one of the happiest, most wonderful little boys. Um, but he lived in Honduras, uh, a place that's actually like an orphanage, a children's home that the resources are are fine, but in the world of living in Honduras, he gets three meals and they don't eat after supper. They don't eat after dark. So his eating pattern looks a lot like this. Uh, you can see in that first, that day, um, he eats here, here, and here. And during the day, that last meal actually goes in by about four o'clock. He eats those meals and his blood sugar goes from about eh, 65, 70 to maybe a little over 105, 110. Each meal is very small portions. Uh, and even though it's filled with carbohydrates, it is a small amount. And, and while well, Willie is a 10 year old boy and running around and, and he's using that energy. During the day, he will eat those three meals. And at night, his body doesn't have any more stored sugar. He has like literally no body fat. And as his body uh, goes to sleep and wakes up for days on end, you'll see that during the day, his system uses glucose. It burns the sugar during the day. That's that red rhomboid square. But at night, his body reaches into the stored fat Maybe it's a little bit of extra food that he put into fat. Uh, it's amazing how efficient fat is for energy. And the energy that, that Willie uses at night to, to grow and to, to actually thrive. He's a healthy boy. Um, and those ketones start out at the uh, you know, 0.5 range. Oh, that's not going to show up. Let's try this. They start out at the 0.5 range when it's low. Now, for most of us, 0.5 is like, yes, I made it into ketosis. Um, but for Willie, that's about as low as his ketones go. When he's asleep at night, they rise up to as high as uh, 1.5, maybe two if he spent a lot of energy that day. Um, during the night is when he is burning fat for fuel. His metabolism is what I would call metabolically flexible. He is not stimulating his belly fat at the age of 10. Let's now take an American boy, uh, another 10-year-old, we'll call him David. And if you've read my book, uh, Keto Continuum, I'm imagining what David's labs looked like when he was 10. So David grew up in a wonderful family uh, in the Midwest where they had three square meals. But unlike uh, Willie, David's meals were a little more abundant. Uh, they didn't have a scarcity of resources. Um, he had this same little blip in his morning cortisol rise. I don't know if you can see that hiding back there. Right before he woke up, his cortisol raised his blood sugar a little bit. And every time he ate, his blood sugars started out not in a dangerous zone, but not as low as Willie's at this level of maybe 82, 85. And it would spike up to about 120 when he ate. His mother was a good, no snacking kind of home, but his last meal went in around 6 p.m. and his sugars were elevated um, probably for a couple hours after that. So you can see that um, David's blood sugars uh, did very similar to what um, they go up during the day and his ketones went down just like Willie's did. Uh, his ketones were also 0.5, but they didn't spike nearly as high. During the day, the carbs are what he burns, the glucose is what he burns, and during the night, he does burn fat, but not nearly as robustly as uh, what the ketones look like. <laughs> Somebody writes in and says, my graphs never look like that. I'm like, yeah, welcome aboard. We've both been around the sun a couple times, Amy. These kids at 10 are metabolically flexible and they're metabolically healthy. Their liver probably has no stored glycogen by three o'clock in the morning. Whereas my liver still probably, I don't know, after a couple days of fasting, I'm sure it's empty, but it might not be on maybe Thursday night or Friday night. So Kevin writes, is this live? Yes, this is live. <laughs> if you put your questions in, I will be answering them here in just a few minutes. So let's look at what happens next. We have um, an advancement. Now David is 17. 
David now has an after-school job, uh, so he doesn't get home from work un until later. He also tends to eat right after school, so he has his breakfast like normal, lunch at school, an after-school snack, and then he eats when he gets home. His blood sugars still range in that 82, they haven't risen that much, and they top out about the 120. But his ketone production is much less. Why? Because his eating window is much wider uh, than it used to be. That he eats from about uh, 6.30 in the morning till at least 9 o'clock at night. This leaves only a few hours to transition that the ketones uh, can rise only after his glucose falls. So as you watch what happens to these him over the several next several days, uh, you'll see that um, only a tiny little bit of shaded area where he's burning fat happens. And now David is 40. David's been around a fun, been around the sun like you and I, Amy, enough times. I'm, I'm 51. Uh, as I look at my uh, stimulus of producing insulin, of constantly stimulating my body to take care of blood sugars, it probably looked like this before before 2015, which is when um, it, the meals went in three times a day. The amount of carbohydrates that I eat didn't seem to be excessive, but it probably was way more than I needed. Um, the glucose would start out, um, he would wake up, Willie, uh, excuse me, David wakes up in the morning, his cortisol takes his blood sugar from about 90 to over 100 before he has his first bite of food. And when he does eat, his blood sugars shoot way too high, up into the 160 range. They don't shoot right back down like they used to, they take more time to fall down. And that is the first sign that your belly fat is doing something different. This is responding to it. Every time the sugars stay high like that, after the liver is filled with sugar, the next place your body is going to store it is right next to those vital organs that need it. And it is absolutely critical that the swallowing of processed carbohydrates, not just for a week or two, not just on Easter, but now David's been going around the sun for 20 years stimulating the constant production of insulin. And things inside his body have changed. Mm. <clears throat> Hopefully that wasn't too loud for whoever doesn't like that. <laughs> All right, let's keep going here. So as David ages, um, he now went from 40 years old to 55 years old. And in the book Keto Continuum, this is where the book starts. Um, his blood sugars in the morning, uh, before the cortisol rise, uh, they're at 100. After the cortisol rise, they're at 120. It, when he eats, it shoots up to in the 160s to 170s. His average blood sugar says he's diabetic. He didn't know that. Why is he diabetic? Because his insulin is not working right. As you watch him age, um, the amount of time spent in a ketogenic state is so rare, is so little that the chances that he has um, uh, a time when the metabolism inside the fat in his belly, and I'm not talking the subcutaneous fat, I'm talking the fat that is very dependent on insulin, that is very dependent on the stimulus that you are giving it day in, day out, 20 years later, that says, Doc, I can't seem to lose my belly fat. I'm like, yeah, I know. It was the first actually to go on, and it's going to be one of the last to come off because of how much you will need to manipulate the, uh, the chemistry inside what's going on. I don't know if you remember this show. It was a great show. One of our coaches says, yes, um, I had a friend. We both weighed about the same. We both lost about 80 pounds, and we did it over similar periods of time. Um, my coach did it using autophagy. Uh, the other woman used had a skin curtain left over because, well, she did not use autophagy. She continued to eat several times a day. She was, um, pro she was able to get a gastric bypass. So several small meals per day is what she kept using. And in that process, she did not lower her insulin. <clears throat> the, insul the insulin might have lowered a little bit, but nothing like what it does when you do autophagy. So hang with me there. In a place where you have autophagy, for every 20 pounds of weight loss, 15 pounds of it are fat and five pounds are lean tissue. 
So let's just say that again. The muscle mass that you have is actually a very important metabolic uh, tool for us to get you healthy again. And if you sacrifice lean tissue as you lose weight, that becomes a compromise for how the other fat cells will ever get emptied. In a state of autophagy, your body selects the fat cells first. It specifically starts to then work on those fat cells that are very resistant to insulin. Now let's move on to Ozempic. Now, uh, well, many of you have written in about how we've talked about this. In the case of Ozempic, instead of the insulin, if this was the, the insulin that happened in autophagy, their insulin goes down like a hockey stick when they're using autophagy when they are figuring out the chemistry. In Ozempic, the, uh, the insulin goes down like this, very slightly, and it still stays quite high compared to what it should do. That difference in still allowing the insulin to be made at a higher rate and secreted at a higher level, for every 20 pounds of somebody on uh, semaglutide or Ozempic-like drugs, uh, five pounds of fat is lost and 15 pounds of lean tissue is lost. This is what they're looking at. This is not what the FDA look, required for this drug to become FDA approved. It is, however, the kind of chemistry uh, that you can, um, you could have predicted this, even, even though that wasn't very much talked about before the drug was so popular. Uh, and the way we're able to see this is to look at their bone density, the DEXA scans, where it measures what is the body's, the, the three different tissues. It measures body's fat, it me measures the lean mass, and it measures the bone. And when they see, again, bone density, you might know a DEXA scan because that's how I'm looking at your bone density for osteoporosis or osteopenia. But we can also very accurately measure how much fat is present and how much lean mass is present. And their weight loss is flipped. Instead of a pref preference for the, for the fat cells to be emptied, it is a preference for the lean tissue mass to be dissolved. So indeed, they are lighter. The scale was less, but it was not the kind of improved health that should be going along with that weight loss. So Many people have written in over the years, and I love teaching about this, that autophagy is something that you can approximate. Again, there is no exact test to tell you, are you in or out of autophagy? We know that at any one time, the number of cells that are in autophagy, um, it will vary, but we can make a pretty solid guess based on two metrics of uh, what, what, um, what insulin impacts. Uh, if I could measure insulin at a beat by beat moment, like I could, um, insulin cost eighty to hundred dollars every time you test it. Uh, it's also got a you know a delay that it's going to take a couple days to come back. So it doesn't give us real time feedback. If I would have you checking your blood, checking your insulin every uh, six to eight hours, um, instead I can check the two molecules that insulin controls. And by doing that, I can show you the, de the chances of autophagy if you get a Dr. Boz ratio of taking your glucose divided by your ketones. Uh, if it's less than 40, you get a pretty good chance that you're in autophagy. Between 40 and 80, you may be in autophagy. But if your Dr. Boz ratio never gets below 100, your um, Dr. Boz ratio or your chances of autophagy are very low. Uh, so again, as we look at, we are trying to impact, uh, let's see here, we are trying to impact this, uh, this visceral fat right here. It is the most stubborn to be lost because it has been there the longest. It is the most insulin resistant now, I mean, sensitive earlier in your years when you were Willie's age or even in, in David's early 20s. But after that constant bathing in insulin, in order to empty these fat cells, I have to have you push into autophagy or your body will choose uh, to destroy the muscle mass instead of emptying the fat cells. All right, so let's take a look at that. So in a Dr. Boz ratio, uh, here's your glucose, here's your ketones. And as that glucose goes down and ketones go up, 
the key factor here is that the insulin got better. Uh, when decreasing uh, not just the amount of insulin. I had somebody at class today say, well, w wouldn't I just want to check my insulin? It isn't, isn't just that your insulin amount is understood. It is how well do your cells listen to insulin? How sensitive are you to insulin? And that, that is the critical question. As I become healthier, it takes a higher amount of stimulus, a higher amount of metabolic surge for me to get a Dr. Boz ratio under 100 that I can fast for 48 hours. And especially if I don't sleep well or if I don't do some other metabolic stimulus, like go to the sauna, go to the workout, I will have terrible numbers by Tuesday night. I mean, terrible meaning I didn't have food for 48, 60 hours and my ketones are 0.7 uh, because the stimulus that my body needs to circulate that fat is very low. And if I'm trying to continually improve my system to not fill any more of my belly fat filled with what was once very insulin resistant fat, uh, I have to keep pushing for that every week, every week. This week, by swallowing a whole bunch of um, C8C10 uh, for, two, for the day before the show, I'm trying to show you that um, my liver got a much better workout than um, than when I just swallow the ketones like I've done in weeks past. So hang tight because I want to deliver this home in two more slides. <clears throat> Before I do that, I have um, a quick announcement. For many of you that uh, come to Tampa and you want to see what is my <clears throat> uh, Tuesday morning support group look like, I had new folks there this morning and just want to say thank you for coming. They got to hear a sneak peek of what I'm going to do. I got to practice a little bit, get a, a little bit of feedback um, for what uh, is going to happen this uh, Friday at KetoCon. Uh, before I hop over there, um, the reason I am demonstrating uh, C8C10 is because I made a mistake. I made a mistake that when I um, had these made, uh, a year and a half ago, and the shelf life was nearly five years, but um, standard uh, processes were to say, yeah, the shelf life of three years should get us plenty of coverage and there should be no problem selling our supply in three years. But indeed, on the bottom of the bottle, there is, I don't know if you can see that, probably can't see that. Well, anyway, it says July of 2023 instead of July of 2024. But once the stamp is on the bottle, there's nothing I can do about it. I have to sell these before the end of July in 2023. Doesn't matter that I made a mistake. Everybody Amazon, from Amazon to Walmart to my website, I can't sell them after um, July of this year. So I am trying to give you a heck of a deal. <laughs> if you need C8C10, and why would you need C8C10? Because if you really wanna make ketones, if you want to push this Dr. Boss ratio, uh, the production of ketones is in part how well trained your mitochondria are for spinning these little fats into ketones. And especially in a fasted state, I mean, you saw my ketones a few minutes ago. Um, once you've trained your body how to do that, you can shoot your ketones up like this. And boy, oh boy, uh, <laughs> I am not hungry at all. <laughs> I love eating on Tuesday night. In fact, I, my favorite little treat I have sitting right over here and I'm like, I am totally not hungry. <laughs> Um, but I do want to show you how you do this. So if you go to my store, uh, you will find that um, the Dr. Boz um, sale over here has four of them for the price of three. Uh, my assistant, because several of you have written in, wants me to make sure to show you. You have to put four of them in the cart. And instead of four times about 30 of $120, you'll see that it is minus $29 for a checkout price of $89. So, and that is enough MCT to last you for several, <laughs> several months. Uh, again, you, it's a great training tool for getting your gut to absorb medium chain triglycerides. Um, when I have somebody with a leaky gut, this is what I start with. I start with one capsule. I think today I've probably taken, I don't know, a fistful this morning and a fistful this afternoon, probably 12 to 15, however many fits in my hand. Uh, I don't like taking that many pills, but I was trying to show you, if you want to see production of ketones, feed your liver MCT. And as you watch, you'll see in our slides here, uh, one of the key components for reversing that blood sugar that won't go down 
is not only the, the presence of energy in your body, which is the presence of ketones, um, but the um, uh, the ability to push past people saying, Doc, I can't seem to get that blood sugar to go down. I've had insulin resistance in the past. How do I how do I reverse this? How do I get that belly fat off? And the answer is, I need to push you into autophagy. Uh, we practice this a lot when we're in, we're working with our groups, but most importantly. I'll teach you on here. I'll show you how to do it. You don't need me to do it. <laughs> Just follow the instructions. Um, I do want to make, make sure before I hop off this page, because I probably won't come back to this, is that I will see you all at KetoCon. I was actually really nervous about my lecture because it's really complicated, but I've given it like four times now, and I'm like, I'm super excited. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good. I don't like to say that about myself, but it's really good. Okay, uh, let's get back to our lesson here. <laughs> Got a little distracted. Okay, here's our insulin. What's next? What's next is when patients come in and they say, Dr. Boz, my glucose is in the 200 range. And I say, yes, dear, it is. And that process of reducing your glucose um, uh, and and raising ketones is, is not always this linear. It is dependent on how insulin resistant you are. When the insulin is flaming like it was uh, in most people as they start out on the ketogenic journey, the insulin gets a little less resistant as the blood sugars go down and as the ketones go up. There is a tipping point where autophagy starts to happen. And that is, you can see where these lines cross, but I can change the height of that glucose and make them cross at different levels. Uh, the point I'm trying to, to show you is as your ketones rise, and your glucose goes down, it is a reflection that your insulin is becoming less and less in, uh, your body's becoming less and less insulin resistance. As I uh, push my system each week and do these numbers each week to show you, um, a Dr. Boss ratio of under 100 used to be rare for me. I, I, I've had insulin resistant too. Uh, it wasn't the first week that I made this look better. It took over a year for me to be able to, to get to a 36 hour fast which I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> I was like, I'd never done that before. Um, and that 36 hour fast still left me with an elevated blood sugar. It was like 105. It wasn't until I consistently followed a ketogenic plan, the volume of food that was matching what my body needed and the um, Dr. Bow's ratio. During that time, I hit autophagy. Uh, I have several of you that have written in that I should do a, a video on what does it look like when your skin reverses age? Because yes, I am 51. But if you go back to before I started the ketogenic diet, well, I probably looked 51, but I was, I don't know, in my 40s somewhere. Uh, and the process of being able to stimulate the turnover of cells and the decreased inflammation, you can, you can see it in my skin. It is not some, I, 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 I don't have anything done to my face. I just put on a little uh, oil and, um, and yeah, and I hit autophagy. Here's one of the coaches who did an excellent job of coaching people in our last course. And if you'll notice, she, the first thing she points out is, I, I used to focus on how um, that my belly was so full, like hard to breathe full. And I've had patients say this for years. And as she worked through lowering her insulin resistance and lowering her blood sugars, uh, that belly fat, the fat on the under, the, she still points out, yeah, the fat right here, I can pinch. I'm like, yeah, but look at the circum, friends. Look at the waist, uh, the, the waistline. What she reduced there was the hardest to reverse fat. That is visceral fat. And if she would do a DEXA scan before she started keto and in that picture after she'd been keto for several months, the most powerful thing she did was manipulate the visceral fat, the kind of fat that isn't going to change when you're taking something like uh, Ozempic, uh, Wagovia. As we look at where she should focus, it was not the scale. The scale was the last thing that's gonna move. And even though it moves, it's, it's, it's such a terrible place for people to focus. Uh, your chemistry set needs to change. And when I teach people how to change a chemistry set, uh, I didn't just come up with a whimsical idea. It is a continuum. A continuum where when I watch what where I live, um, I keep my, I live at this line right here. 
I don't eat within an hour. I eat within about um, a three to four hour window. Um, and then at least for 48 hours every week, I fast. I go with salt and water only. Now this last day I added the MCT because, oh my goodness, does it shoot my ketones up. <laughs> Maybe I needed that creativity to finish the, the, the lecture that I was preparing for Friday. Uh, when I start people on the ketogenic diet, uh, I have to fix, I have to resurrect their, uh, their hormones that are all built from fat, that are all just as locked in as that visceral fat. When patients write in and say, doc, my testosterone is terrible. And the men will say, I, I, I have no testosterone. Can I have an injection? I'm like, not from me. Uh, find somebody else that will probably say yes. Just like somebody else is probably going to give you Ozempic the first night out of the gate. Uh, if you have a testosterone that's low and you just replace it, but you still have insulin screaming at you day in, day out, the insulin is too high. Guess what happens to that fat-based hormone called testosterone? Oh yeah, it gets stored right in the belly fat. If you have a progesterone or estrogen problem, and yet you bathe it in insulin, just like David did for 20 years, he ate too much food, too many times a day, too late at night. And the insulin was stimulating. His insulin was constantly saying, get it out of the circulation, get it out of the circulation. And it did that to all your fat-based hormones too. Step one of reversing the process is I have to shift the chemistry deep within your cells. And that means that when patients show up and they eat every two to four hours, I say that's typical. That's what happens. As they reduce their carbohydrates to 20 total carbohydrates, 20 total grams of carbohydrates per day, they slowly start to eat at, long, at wider intervals. They eat every six to eight hours. And, and, and what happens when people watch videos like this is they quickly hop over and they try to become willy. They try to eat really tiny meals for three times early in the day. And I'm saying, stop that. You have such a resurrection of hormones that we have to fix first that you will crash and burn in three weeks if we don't do this in a stepwise process. The third step is, uh, well, in this process, the whole reason I'm having you go slower, that if you're insulin resistant and you really want the belly fat to reverse, I have to flip the chemistry. The chemistry is what dictates what's going to happen in your belly fat. It's going to dictate whether or not your testosterone or your estrogen ever return to anything close to normal. Be sure to eat high fat with few carbs. Your body uses the fat to restore your fat built hormones. Elevated insulin within your body prevents you from using the stored fat. You must eat fat. This is just the basic outline to what I teach in my, um, to my patients. It's what we cover in Tuesday morning. And actually, we don't actually cover much of it in Tuesday morning. I usually hand you the book and say, fill out the workbook. I've explained this thousands of times. And as soon as you read this workbook, you're going to know what I told thousands of patients because I wrote it down and I'm tired of telling people these, the basic stuff. I want to get to the advanced questions, which is what I am working on for um, our um, for the uh, talk on Friday. Uh, Friday's talk uh, at KetoCon in Austin is going to be, oh, it's going to be so good. I hope it goes good. I hope I don't have any tech issues. Pray for me, please, that nothing like that goes wrong. Uh, I have been working with my assistant uh, and team probably since before Christmas on trying to get this to deliver in a way that I don't lose my audience, that people don't say that was way over my head. Um, we're going to answer your questions here in a minute. I do have a, 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 an appointment tonight at, at uh, that my son uh, is a wrestler here at um, in Tampa at his high school, and they have a banquet for wrestling tonight. Um, so I'm going to go be a mom here in a few minutes. But I am going to answer a few of your questions before I do that. And I... Um, I really appreciate those of you that did buy the MCT last week. Um, please, uh, those of you that wrote in saying, why didn't I get a discount? It's probably because you only bought one or two instead of put four in your basket. And that's how you'll get the discount. Again, I can't sell them after July. So I'm really trying to, to, yeah, just some humble pie of lessons learned. 
I should have noticed the date. All right, let's go to your questions uh, and see what you guys have to ask. Um, here we go. Oh, Janet is our first question today. Mm, let me grab that, go over here. And Janet writes in and says, uh, let me just pull this a little easier for me to read it. Uh, so how many MCTs should you take? It says three twice a day. Yeah, the, the FDA tells me what I can say and what I can't say. It is not FDA approved, I mean, meaning the FDA doesn't study like it would a prescription medication, but um, there are certain standards that you put on a bottle, and then there's what you, um, <laughs> you said a fistful, yes. Um, so let me talk about uh, when, um, when you do a study using MCT. So several times you've seen me talk about brains on this uh, um, on this channel, and if I I look at why I chose to keep MC, uh, MCT with C8 and C10, is because the C8 is still the best return of making ketones, but C8 and C10 both can cross the blood-brain barrier. And several studies have been done to look at what it does for cognition, how it helps with improving mood reversing um, some of the chronic diseases of aging for the brain, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And although I can't make any claims like that on the bottle, I get to see patients uh, and show them that the studies, when they look at MCT, um, well, they had uh, 30 to 45 grams of MCT per day, okay? Um, let me see. Each one of these is a gram, so that would be 30 to 45 of these soft gels a day. Uh, and that was the study. Now, interesting enough, the study <clears throat> had a, because um, they took people off of like a, they weren't on a ketogenic diet, they weren't fat adapted, they were just people struggling with memory. And then they would give them this large amount of fat. I mean, just like oil to swallow, right? Um, and unfortunately, they lost a lot of people to follow up, or lost a lot of people because they dropped out because they got diarrhea. So um, you, you may have heard me talk in the past that when I am trying to tra train somebody's bowel to be better at absorbing fat, um, and this isn't a pancreatic enzyme issue, this is your, your bowel has receptors and has uh, cells that are in charge of secreting that bile, emulsifying that fat, and then absorbing it, um, either in a digestive process or straight into the portal vein. Um, that process is kind of rusty in many people with insulin resistance. They haven't had to practice that. And so when they first start on it, man, they take two tablespoons of that oil and they just have the squirts, they go right to the toilet. Uh, so to, I don't want them taking just saturated fats in a day. I don't want them just eating butter like I did a couple weeks ago. I actually want them using the most efficient oil that turns into ketones because now I'm fixing the inside chemistry. I'm decreasing that inflammation. I'm helping them you know, suppress appetite by raising those ketones. And the process of absorbing that fat is something your cells have to re- you could say relearn, but they the, the receptors just need to be reawakened. I mean, they have been kind of sleepy. There's been nothing for them to do because you haven't eaten that in years. So, I mean, that's why I took two fistfuls. I wasn't worried. My gut is very fat adapted. I did not get a tummy ache from it. Uh, I did get great ketones. We'll check them here at the end of the show and see if they are any higher. I don't, I don't know how you get higher than that, but um, it, it's um, a very... Uh, encouraging to me to, to, last week when I took them, I took them at the beginning of the show, and then at the end of the show, it, it had probably been like 40 minutes since I swallowed them, and so it just wasn't enough time to show you that, oh, about an hour and a half later, I'm like, oh, now my ketones are high, and I'm trying to go to sleep. So I started earlier today, and then showing you on the show that, yes, this is why I, I make the product, is that I have patients who, well, they, they need a lot more help than they're able, their bodies are able to produce. Their insulin resistance was gonna last a long time. And as much as I drink those short-acting ketones on the show, um, the ones that uh, pucker up, uh, or any of the ones that are the BHB, that'll raise my ketones for a couple of hours. It will stimulate my liver, one that's in good shape, to make more ketones tomorrow. But if you're insulin resistant, the best answer is to give your liver a workout slip that medium chain triglycerides into your liver, which is what MCT C8C10 does, and that causes the mitochondria to spin out ketones. 
uh, that that is a a process where again the first time you swallow them you're not going to get the results that I do I've been doing this since 2015 when you have a metabolism that is used to producing ketones spinning out ketones from fat you add the ketones in and it, it works better but as you are an insulin if you're an insulin resistant patient one with belly fat Step one is you got to get ketones in circulation. Those short acting ketones, you have to sip on all day long. And I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at that. I would sip on it and then I'll forget. Um, if I take the, if you take the fat, you get ketones um, in production, in your circulation for six to eight hours, a much better treatment plan. And they're a whole lot cheaper than, than the, the beta hydroxy, the ketones in a can, the ketones in pucker up. Okay, long answer, but thank, very good question. Very good question. Uh, all right, let's go back to the questions. Uh, Connie says, I need help. My, <laughs> my hemoglobin A1C uh, last year was 5.7 or 5.6. Now it's 5.7. I ate clean for a year. Why? My cholesterol went down from 270 to 236. My tri oh, your triglycerides are beautiful. Yeah, average blood sugars are nasty that way. Uh, they, the littlest things matter. Uh, one of the one of the uh, biggest uh, reveals that I have learned about A1C is when people are using a continuous glucose monitor and what's happening at night. Uh, so again, 5.6 to 5.7 is not a lot of difference. You're right, it's the wrong direction. We would love it to go down. Um, when it's trending in the wrong direction, um, you, you do want to have a, a look to make sure that your insulin is working. I have a couple of patients where uh, they had burned out their insulin production. They just cannot make enough of the insulin to keep their blood sugar down. So as much as they want to stay off of insulin, their pancreas is dying. Uh, they don't live in 1800. Uh, they need to take long injecting insulin, even though they're on a ketogenic diet. I mean, they burned out the ability to produce enough insulin to keep it low. Now, I don't know that that's what's happening. It's such a tiny difference. I wouldn't freak out about that. The fact that you have such low triglycerides says that's probably not the problem. When somebody's insulin isn't working, you'll see the, I mean, you'll see the triglycerides are going high. You'll see that their blood sugars are higher than that. So um, uh, your cholesterol and your triglycerides look great um, with a A1C of 5.6 to 5.7. A couple other things can happen is the length of your red blood cells could have been shorter. They can be iron deficient. They can be B12 deficient. So there's different reasons why a red blood cell will, la will live longer or shorter, and that can change your A1C when other things seem to not be changing. Um, and then I would, I would invest in a continuous glucose monitor. We're trying to figure out a way to offer that to people because I don't think you should have to see a doctor for a continuous glucose monitor, but we're not quite ready for that yet. Uh, it, it's a, it is amazing though how much people learn. I mean, one time of three months of wearing a continuous glucose monitor and bam, they learn so much. They learn about sleep. They learn why sleep is so important at suppressing uh, their blood sugars. And when they when they worry about giving us a, a lecture that, that, that isn't gonna go well and they don't sleep well, their sugars are worse the next day. Ask me how I know. Uh, I'm gonna sleep great tonight though. <laughs> well, I, hope, I hope my ketones let me sleep great tonight. All right, one more question before I gotta run over and be a mom at the banquet for my son. Oops, wrong one. Uh, oh, wrong one again, good grief. Uh, Vani, first of all, Vani, I love your name. One of my favorite people in the whole world's name is Vani. Um, how do I stop the sweet cravings? I've recently added 50 micrograms of chromium to my diet. Okay, so sweet cravings are because sweet sweets have landed on your tongue. Uh, when I look at the most effective way for sweets to be stopped, it is stop eating sweets. Um, you're like, oh, wait, wait, I, I don't get any? I'm like, no, you don't get any. Um, when people have a craving for sweets, we take it off the plate. Uh, it is a rotten first week. They do not like me, but by golly, by the third week, they can't believe how much less they want sugar. Uh, that perpetuation of sugar is dopamine based. And it's the same reason that if you drink alcohol, I would tell you, stop the alcohol. We have to stop the stimulus in order to fix the problem. And when, pe when people have a, sh a sugar craving, it's very, <laughs> I just did a short today talking about one of my biggest mistakes or my, my my guilty pleasures was, um, you know, I, I think everybody has a, you know, keto kryptonite. What is it that throws you off the wagon? And for the longest time, it was macadamia nuts. Like if I bought the bag, I ate the whole stinking thing. So I had to stop buying the bag. 
Um, but at one point I had somebody uh, give me a bottle of vinegar and it was the best tasting vinegar. Like it was fancy and a pretty bottle, but I just got to the point where I'd just take a swig right out of the vinegar bottle. <laughs> and then I, I was like, I, part of me knew this couldn't be good for me because as soon as I'd get done with it, I'd want a little bit more. And then I'd want a little bit more. I'm like, dang, I really can't believe how addictive that is. And it wasn't so much the vinegar, it was me. I have been addicted to sugar. I have loved this. I have used this to soothe my brain and feel better. And the sad part is, is that even though the sugar cravings were something that I, you know, this out-of-body experience, like, oh, who's who, who did this to me? It, it was because I kept tasting it that I kept wanting it more. And I really got busted when I put on a continuous glucose monitor. And there's this thing that sets it for like 180 or something really high. I mean, maybe it was only 160, but it was it had an alarm on it. And so I took a swig, <laughs> a swig of my, my vinegar, which sounds pretty darn keto, right? Well, this was way too sweet to ever be keto. And man, it sent the alarm right off. And my kids were like, busted, mom. You've been drinking out of the vinegar bottle again, haven't you? <laughs> Anyway, the point of the story is the way you stop sugar cravings is you stop the sugar, just like the way you stop alcohol cravings. Stop. Um, I'll tell you, the support group really helps. Let me check my numbers here at the end of the show, and then I will run over to the uh, banquet and um, uh, see uh, what uh, my son has. Um, all right, last thing here is check my sugars uh, right before I walk out of the door. And then I will see all of you that are coming to KetoCon. I hope to show my, I hope my speech is as good on Friday as it was today that I, when I was practicing it. Glucose is 75, so I think that's a little bit higher than it was at the beginning. And ketones, uh, 2.8. Plenty high. <laughs> Plenty high. Well, that's a wrap for our show tonight, you guys. I hope your belly fat gets smaller. I hope you use some of the chemistry lessons we went through tonight. Uh, we are the Dr. Boz Show. And if you are looking for a great uh, discussion about how those medium chain triglycerides work, we would love to show you that on the video at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the show. But uh, until then, we'll see you next week.